Honorable Alexander Nechitailo. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I hope I got the pronunciation of your name right. <laughs> Sounds very familiar. I think you have 99.9% right. We're almost there, almost there. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I completely understand that these are really, really tough times for you, of course. Uh, you know, the tragic situation we have right now in Europe, uh, in your country, your resistance against the invading forces. So I really appreciate this opportunity to pick your mind and also shed some light on uh, the, re the relevance of the developments on the ground and what we can look forward to uh, in terms of peace prospects uh, and also in terms of the future of relations between our two countries, the Philippines and Ukraine. Uh, after all, the Philippines also made some statements regarding uh, the invasion of Ukraine as far as the United Nations is concerned. So we wanna talk about that uh, a bit, but let me first start, um, Ambassador. Um, well, actually back in February, I was one of the delegates at the Munich Security Conference when where your president, uh, Pleder, uh, President Zelensky, actually gave a very impassioned speech and made it very clear that with or without the support of the West, Ukraine will resist any invading forces. And I think in many ways, we have seen that he has stood by his side of the bargain. Uh, and we saw the pressure in the West to also make sure that they assist you as much as possible. But I wanted to ask a question and get your honest point of view, because I had a lot of discussion with our counterparts, with our friends in the West. And a lot of them were, I, would, I believe, were actually skeptical behind the scenes that actually this invasion, this actual invasion would happen. They thought maybe Russia will try to make some moves in Donetsk, in some of the areas uh, occupied by pro-Russian rebels, but not necessarily go on a full invasion of including Kiev and major cities in Ukraine. Uh, you, Ambassador, honestly, did you folks expect that there will be actually this full-scale invasion? Based your understanding of President, President Vladimir Putin and also Russian foreign policy in recent decades? Uh, first Paul, thank you for having me today. It's, it's important, of course, to share the word of truth, and uh, our perspective is equally important to understand the whole complexity and the history of the issue. When it comes to the invasion, whether it was imminent or not, we've been receiving the intelligence report for quite some time. I think the first came probably middle of the, uh, September, or even October last year. And of course, when you look at the military buildup of, on our border, We've been understanding that something is brewing. In terms of uh, how imminent was, was it, I think the turning point, perhaps, when the Russians started to deploy the field hospitals and the hospitals were starting to pile up the blood banks. Blood banks is something that is perishable. So basically, you would not start to, to do that unless you really plan to treat some casualties and to, to, to have some, you know, use for that, for that, for that blood. So in that sense, that was the point when we realized that it's going to be something very serious, although in terms of scale, that all the cities, practically all major cities in Ukraine were subjected to the military and airstrikes. Of course, I think in, in that sense, it, 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 it came also as a shocking surprise to, to many of us. Right. I mean, that's also the sense we get that I think many, many, including some of the allies of Russia, my, my suspicions, even China was perhaps not not uh, expecting such a full scale invasion. Um, Ambassador, before going to the meat of this discussion, for the benefit of our audience, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorance, I would say, or lack of proper understanding of the cultural differences. I mean, th there's a lot of knowledge about similarities between Ukrainian culture and language and the Russian culture and language. I think President Putin has always tried to, some would say, overemphasize those similarities. But we know that Ukraine has a very distinct culture, right? Yes, I mean, uh, you can, we can talk about, uh, you know, Gogol and a lot of very important Ukrainian figure in history that also played a very important role in Russian cultural history in a florid sense. But we know that Ukraine also has a very unique history from the medieval times. You were more oriented towards the West, the Polish, Lithuanian Commonwealth. So large parts of Ukraine actually had a very different geopolitical and cultural and even intellectual tradition from you know, what is today's Russia, which was really under the Moscovite you know, uh, kingdom and all, and its orientation was more towards the East and the South, et cetera. But I wanna hear it from you. Um, yes, there are similarities, but, but can you explain to us in what sense, I, I know this is 
self-evident supposedly, but unfortunately, I think there's a lot of disinformation around this. Can you clarify to us in what sense Ukraine is really distinct, a distinct, some would even say civilization, despite its similarities with Russia? Well, Ukraine is a multilingual and multicultural and multi-religious country. Historically, Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, has been the uh, cradle of the Eastern European civilization. The history of Kyiv itself is more than years old. When it comes to similarities or historical past or so-called brotherhood, as they often put in by the Russian put, put by the Russian propaganda. You have to understand that the history of Moscow is less than 900 years old. So in terms of history, in terms of culture, in terms of traditions and the statehood, Kiev has been always the forefront of the statehood in that part of the world. When it comes also to the language and other things like religion, we've been always looking at it at, at, as something that has been, uh, you know, of advantage to us or something that can unite people, not divide the people. Therefore, even in the current Ukraine, if you look at the composition ethnically, we have about 25 percent, uh, slightly less maybe, of ethnic Russians now. However, in terms of their self-identification, they are Ukrainian citizens and they are fully integrated uh, as, as Ukrainians. That's why all these false narratives of you know, necessity to somehow protect the Russian language or the Russian culture being somehow you know, uh, not respected in Ukraine, these are all, all false narratives. So uh, if you look at the mindset, what's the major difference between the Russians and Ukrainians? Ukraine has been uh, free loving and independent uh, people in terms of personal liberties that was the ultimate value for many ukrainians and if you look at the history of ukrainian cossacks we had the world written constitution that was the bill of rights and liberties that was written 70 years before the u.s constitution was passed in, in, in the 18th century in ukraine and until now those values uh, I would call it embedded in our DNA, and therefore we stand up for those values, even though, you know, when it comes to political part of the issue, mm. it's European Union values, NATO values, or generally the world values, we would stand up uh, for those values regardless of the political the political uh, discourse in the country. And what we have seen on the ground now is Ukrainians, for us, this uh, resistance to the aggression, it comes uh, from our view, from our values, and therefore it makes us invincible, you know. Other than that, it's a fight not just between, let's say, Ukrainians and Russians. We believe this is the fight of two uh, different worlds, the world of uh, free, peaceful, and, 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 the, and somebody who wants to impose other views of us on us. Uh, during the 1,500 years history, we did other country or nation. And you rightly pointed that parts of Ukraine historically been divided between the Russian Empire, Polish and Lithuanian Kingdom, the Austrian and Hungarian Empire. However, what unites us is our culture and our values. So that is something, the bottom line, even in our national ID cards, we never state somebody's ethnicity or religion, because for Ukraine, Every person, every individual that lives in Ukraine is a citizen with equal freedoms. Right. Thank you very much for pointing that out. So, so Ambassador, here where I'm going to begin to ask a little bit more challenging questions. So I think now we set the tone. Um, there have been a lot of accusations that, uh, I mean, we know that President Volodymyr Zelensky is of Jewish descent. So I think that's a very much reflection of the cosmopolitan and multicultural nature of Ukraine. At the same time, uh, we have, you know, pro-Kremlin outlets, folks in Russia accusing uh, uh, Ukraine of being a supposedly a neo-Nazi regime. There have been discussion of the Azov Brigade, for instance, some of the more far-right uh, elements in Ukraine being involved in some of the military operations throughout the past decade and the latest of course, resistance against Russia. Uh, what do you say about that? I mean, for some people that is out of this world, but unfortunately, uh, I'll be honest about it, Ambassador, I've seen a lot of people online uh, essentially regurgitating that, including here in the Philippines. I mean, I was very shocked. I come back from Europe. I'm expecting to have a fresh discussion because I'm sure not everyone is very familiar with the nitty gritties of Ukraine. 
Next thing I know, there it seems there's a, already a script out there, right? And it's shocking whenever I make a statement on Ukraine, I'll see all of these posts about Azov Brigade, far right elements, supposedly the need for denazification of Ukraine and all. And for me, it's it, that's crazy because your president is of Jewish descent, right? You have a very cosmopolitan political class and population. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know it might sound laughable, but this is. This is a real accusation that is being uh, thrown out and unfortunately is being regurgitated right and left. You have to understand one fundamental thing. Ukraine is a democracy with the rule of law. We are the member of the Council of Europe. And in that sense, we abide all the international uh, principles of the law in, uh, in terms of also the uh, radical theories or radical, you know, movements in Ukraine. So for you to understand in Ukraine, all authoritarian or let's say uh, autocratic uh, ideology has been banned by law, including Nazi ideology and communist ideology. Even the symbols of Nazism and symbols of communism are banned by law. If you display in public a symbol of communism or let's say of Nazism, you will be Penalized. So in that sense, it's uh, absolutely, uh, how they say, baseless to assume that Ukraine, especially when it comes to the government policies, would somehow entertain radical theories or radical political movements. So if you look at the history of the independent Ukraine for the past 30 years, Ukraine has a succession of power. Every time we have an elected leader, uh, the transition of power has been done in a very smooth way, although sometimes those leaders represent entirely different, sometimes even polar, polarized uh, political forces. But in that sense, what makes Ukraine strong is the foundational democracy, the institutions of state that are strong, and then they allow for, for, the, for the society, for the NGOs, political parties to, 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 to continue to, uh, to, to prosper, I would say, in a very competitive environment. That's why people are very uh, careful in terms of, uh, you know, their political uh, votes, in terms of their uh, political sympathies, etc., etc. So the whole notion of, uh, you know, a person with a Jewish descent being the leader of a, a neo-Nazi state, of course, is ridiculous. Not even entertain, uh, you know, going deep into that. Again, uh, we don't look at the person's ethnicity or religious beliefs when it comes to, you know, uh, personal values of politicians or whatever. People in Ukraine vote for certain mandate for political party or for the individual. And then they expect from that individual who elects into the public, who's been elected in the public office, to meet very high standards of accountability. So that's also one of the fundamental things for Ukrainians that we, we, we would never compromise. So to answer the question of Azov, there were a lot of controversies. So let me just put things in a bit yes, of perspective. Please, Ambassador, yeah, this keeps on popping up. And we know for what reason it keeps on popping up. Yes, please. How Azov was created? In 2014, when Russia invaded Ukraine, Ukrainian armed forces were not in a such, uh, let's say, condition to uh, face this kind of overwhelming sense. There were a lot of volunteers coming from all parts of Ukraine, from all kinds of background, to come and defend uh, the homeland. So Azov was one of the first, uh, let's say, units that was created from the volunteers. Uh, later on, they become part of the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs. Some of those individuals that had some, let's say, backgrounds that were not uh, matching the criteria of serving in the regular army units were, uh, let's say, expelled or somehow, you know, got rid of. But in that sense, now Azov is the regular unit of the Ministry of Home Affairs, and uh, they are very motivated. Those stories around it, uh, you know, being created and being pushed around by the Russian propaganda to somehow instill this image of Ukraine as a neo-Nazi state, and there are some, let's say, uh, atrocities or, or whatever they, they, they call, or to distract from the crimes for the uh, violation of the international humanitarian law that is taking place in Ukraine. Uh, is now uh, defending uh, the city of Mariupol together with uh, our other unit of the Ukrainian Marine Marines. So in that sense, if you see that uh, Russia was 
to take over Mariupol after more than 40 days of siege, you know, and this absolutely unbearable destruction of civil infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, you know, mass killings of, of, of innocent people there, shows that the defenders of Ukraine, they are well much, and they are motivated not by the ideology, but uh, by, by their very essence, uh, you know, to protect their, their own families, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, Ukraine, uh, in terms of far-right parties, they have very minimal to non-existent representation, right, in the parliament. I mean, we know there are far-right parties in Western Europe who may have even more representation than in Ukraine. I think this is some of the facts that is perhaps missing in terms of discussion of Ukraine. The other question I want to ask, uh, Ambassador, is this. Um, you know, last year when the Taliban was closing in on the gates of Kabul, you know, there was... Uh, there were all of these intelligence assessments by the Americans that perhaps they can hold out for weeks, if not months, etc. cetera. Uh, and we saw what happened, of course, even before the Taliban came, the government folded. When it comes to Ukraine, it seems the opposite happened. There were a lot of intelligence assessment that any invasion of Ukraine, uh, including by Western agencies, that perhaps Ukraine could not hold out as long as many people are seeing now, right? Uh, we, you folks, I mean, uh, as a Ukrainian, are you surprised by the level of success Ukrainian forces are having uh, on the convention in terms of conventional warfare? And also with respect to President Zelensky, I know he's a lawyer by training. I know his background, but a lot of people, of course, know him for his the Netflix series, right? Servant of the people. He's known as a comedian who made it as a president. So it seems a lot of people are also surprised to see this other side, uh, or some would even say the real side of President Zelensky. It's kind of a very tough uh, you know, uh, and some would even say Churchillian side to him uh, in the past month or so. As a Ukrainian, I, I know you're the ambassador and you have to send out a certain message, but honestly, were you surprised pleasantly by the success of the Ukrainian conventional resistance and also by the kind of almost some would say Churchillian leadership that President Zelensky has displayed over the past month or so? And let me say probably this, that uh, the war uh, that uh, was imposed on us became a big challenge, a big test for leadership and for uh, for, for every one of us. I mean, in, whether you are in the position of president ambassador or you're just an ordinary citizen of Ukraine. Mm. President Zelensky has been showing extraordinary leadership and his uh, famous quote, I don't need a right, I need a munition, becomes now the motto for, for I think, for any Ukrainians and uh, inspires a lot of, uh, I think, international politicians. By far, he is the most respected politician in the world, and he's been invited to speak before the parliaments across the world. You know, UK, US, Japan, you just named. And the UN General so, Assembly, uh, right? Yeah. Yes, most recently he, he spoke at the UN General Assembly at the UN Security Council. And in in, in a sense of his messages, if you notice, he's been always very straightforward, you know, uh, saying things that normally politicians are trying to soften or trying to avoid. So uh, the sense, because he is a very sincere person, uh, he does not have any political background. So when people voted him into office, he received a lot of uh, trust and the mandate to change the things that were that people were not happy about for so many years and that probably integrity and that trust that people put on him you know is one of the uh, most motivating forces that makes people in ukraine stand up against the aggressor i'm not surprised honestly in uh, that uh, we've achieved so much success because uh, this becomes a very uh, patriotic war for us. You know, I have thousands of examples, not just my own friends and family, but those, a lot of uh, elderly people who uh, took up the arms to protect their homes. My own family is in Kiev. They refused to leave even during the darkest hours because that's the sentiment that is overwhelming on the ground. We are in our homes. We're going to fight until the last, uh, I don't know, bullet, but we're going to stand up there and defend our families, our home. So uh, we are fighting the just cause, and that is probably something that gives us a big advantage on the ground. If you saw generally the conventional forces, what was used to be the second largest uh, armed forces in the world, when it comes to the ground, we understand they, in fact, poorly equipped 
they are not motivated and that also uh, gives us uh, that a lot sense of that, right and a lot of them are yeah. conscripts they're not professional a lot of them are conscripts and uh, you know those who were captured by our armed forces they only had the uh, ratio and the fuel and the munition for 3 days so they expected this to finish in 3 days but then they were left behind without no logistic support their means of communications are outdated very often they use mobile phones to uh, for the communication between the military units what you see generally it's 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 uh, russia in many ways there was this expression historically potemkin village when mm. there were certain settlements you know creating this kind of Beautiful image ones. of uh, yeah which does not actually reflect the reality so russian armed forces in many ways uh, it is also i think the the reflection of potemkin village although there are them and they are still very strong and i'm sure they they not going to just give up it's going to be a long and vicious fight however in that sense morally we already achieved the victory and also on the ground we managed to push the enemy away from the capital away from the uh, northern eastern part of ukraine so now the focus of the military efforts is towards the south and southeast right well i mean of course i mean historically the real person potemkin was a deputy of catherine the great i actually created a beautiful place when catherine had to go, go down but this is a different topic now i know there's not much time so i'm going to go into the last two or very i think important questions here and this is where it's relevant to us because we are us ally in the philippines we're also going through our own motions when it comes to our relations with also our giant neighbor if you have russia we have china not necessarily the same powers i know ukraine has a very good relationship with china too you have helped china to build up their armed forces you're hoping that china will be constructive and helpful in terms of resolution of this conflict but we have territorial disputes with china and a lot of people in the philippines are saying maybe the way forward is neutrality maybe the way forward is will not stick to the americans that much because that will provoke the uh, the chinese so the best thing is we will be neutral and as an extension of that i'm hearing some people at least right i'm not going to name names saying that why didn't ukraine just give up on membership on nato right and just avoid all of this conflict because i'm hearing and i'll be honest about it many people are saying okay yes zelensky president zelensky has shown a lot of courage etc now he's showing some openness to maybe revise their constitution etc referendum on the nato membership why didn't he do it to begin with you should have just given up on nato membership and we could have avoided all of these problems what do you say to that line of argumentation uh, ambassador nechitailo no, uh, obviously, I don't have any recipe for the Philippines. I can share you the history of Ukraine. In 1991, when Ukraine became independent, and uh, in the act of our Declaration for Independence, we declared that Ukraine is going to be a neutral, non-aligned country and a non-nuclear country. Because when the Soviet Union collapsed, we inherited the third largest nuclear arsenal, more than 1,000 warheads, and I think a few hundred of intercontinental ballistic missiles. So uh, in 1994, Ukraine was persuaded by the major nuclear powers, including United States, United Kingdom, and Russia, later joined by France, the non-proliferation treaty. And in exchange for that, Ukraine was given the assurance from the nuclear powers that they will never use force, threat of use of force, or any other means to somehow infringe our sovereignty and territorial integrity. Ironically, 20 years later, one of the signatories to that memorandum, it's called Budapest Memorandum uh, on Guarantees for Ukraine, became an aggressor. So in 2014, when Russia invaded Ukraine, we were not having uh, uh, part of being part of NATO as part of our constitution. The amendments to the constitution to join the NATO membership were made in 2018, precisely in response, in response to the aggression. Yes, precisely in response to the foreign aggression. What is obvious now, and generally very often people uh, overlook or don't understand the nature of the North Atlantic Alliance. North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization does not impose it, it, its membership on, on, on other countries. In fact, it's smaller countries like Poland, Baltic states, or ex warsaw Bloc countries, they voluntarily apply for membership. And to be a member, 
But you have to, you have to meet very strict criteria, not just in terms of your defense forces, defense posture, but also in terms of your uh, democracy, institutions, independence of judiciary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is precisely because works uh, on a consensus basis. So every country which becomes a member has to be a democracy floor, and that prevents uh, from any, let's say, potential misuse of power by any member state, because the right. treaty is very clear. It's a collective defense, defensive mechanism. So for smaller countries, uh, it is imper imperative to be part of the bigger security mechanism, because otherwise you would never be able to, to, to stand against the bigger power. So it's just a matter of survival. The other very important thing that is often overlooked or misinterpreted uh, by the Russian propaganda, for instance, is that uh, when the Cold War ended in the 90s, beginning of the 90s, there was never a promise from the NATO states not to expand eastwards. This is a false narrative by the developed Russian propaganda. Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the president of the USSR at that time, and Edward Shevardnadze, who was the foreign minister of the USSR, in their memoirs, they are very clear there was no formal promise for NATO not to expand eastwards. What was formal promise in 1994 for Ukraine to give up nuclear weapons and in exchange change assurance. However, it worked. You see, neutrality did not work for us. Therefore, we believe only by being part of the biggest security mechanism, uh, that's this. That's something that would really uh, help us to, to protect our sovereignty and territorial integrity. And if you look at the latest comments by President Zelensky, he's always emphasizing that uh, amendments to the Constitution can be discussed. However, only in the uh, bigger context of providing Ukraine with the security guarantees that are effective and they are workable. Based on the Budapest uh, memorandum, right? Of, we're talking about 1994 after the, the nuclearization. Uh, I want to go back to this because we hear this is not only from Russia. We have folks like John Mersheimer, of course, famously or notoriously, depending on how you see his arguments, saying that this is essentially the fault of the West, especially when President George W. Bush in 2008 essentially said that Georgia and Ukraine should be, or at some point will be part of, of NATO, and that has provoked supposedly Russia. That's the argument. And of course, the Russian side keep on citing John Mersheimer and a number of folks arguing along those lines. But one thing that I don't think is as much discussed and coming from a quote unquote smaller country, and this is what I find very annoying is that people talk as if it's only the big countries who have agencies. It's the only them who have decisions to make. I think what is not discussed is why a lot of Baltics, I mean, all the Baltics, a lot of them, Romania, Poland, Hungary, a lot of these Eastern Central European countries, what did, why did they decide to join NATO as soon as they got a chance? I think this is a question that a lot of people are not asking. It's all about what NATO and what Russia are doing to each other, right? Now, as a Ukrainian, why do you think they, it seems a lot of them rush to join the NATO as soon as they can. And you, at some point, signal your willingness to join the NATO. Why? Why would you want to do that? Well, uh, again, Ukraine is a democracy. And democracy is not uh, the perfect, let's say, system. But as mm. we know, I think it, it's quite common. So in Ukraine, political process and to achieve any political consensus on certain issues takes usually... And if you look at the political situations in the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, for instance, Poland or uh, Czech Republic or Hungary at that time, there was a national wide consensus that those countries would like to become the members of European Union and NATO as soon as possible. For Ukraine, it took a bit of time to realize that these are the things, this is the formula that will lead us as a nation to, nation to success. Therefore, to build up this nationwide consensus took a bit of time. And again, you see, but that's the difference between autocracy and democracy. In autocracy, you can impose your view on the people and then do certain things depending on the leader. If the leader is, uh, let's say, good or uh, uh, educated. So you had to build consensus, ambassador. So you had yeah, to so it, it, it took a time to build the, the, yeah. the consensus. Yeah, and of course, I think the decisive point was the, the, the tip, the, 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 the iceberg was the invasion of 2014 and the illegal annexation of Crimea. Then we realized that uh, it's, it, it is 
do it on our own. Although, as you see, what is happening on the ground now with a lot of efforts and a lot of resources, you know, being put in, we, we are quite successful in, in, in defending our country on our own so far. Right. Uh, Ambassador, I have to emphasize this. Uh, Ukraine is not a treaty ally of the United States because this is a very important point. At the same time, if you look at the uh, Budapest uh, memorandum, I think the Ukrainian or the Russian term uses the word guarantee. But if you ask the Americans, they say they, should, they said assurances. So it's, I think, legally speaking, the ramifications are quite different because when you use the term guarantee, which is, I think, the Russian or Ukrainian word used, uh, it is more like what's NATO doing if in, in case of collective defense. Now, I know that's a debate, and I know, of course, you have your own diplomacy with the Americans, but one of the, one of the reasons why what's happening in Ukraine is also very important for us as U.S. allies is that people are looking at this and saying, is U.S. a reliable international partner? In our case, will it be a reliable treaty ally? Now, I know President Zelensky has been doing both at the same time, like, gratitude but pressure gratitude pressure i see what he's doing very smoothly played i would say as a geopolitical analyst uh, you ambassador what is your assessment of the degree of assistance you have been getting from nato and especially from americans over the past few years i understand initially there were a lot of disappointments but it seems now there's a lot of move by the u.s congress by the Biden administration to give you the weaponries, the financing, the, the assistance, and the diplomatic support, not to mention the biggest sanction barrage in human history. So now Russia is the most sanctioned country on earth, right? No other country even comes close, right? Um, what is your assessment of that? Is America a reliable partner? If yes and no, why and how? May I get your point on that? Because this is very important for us as, as Filipinos. We're also watching. Can we count on our treaty allies amidst our own territorial dispute with another giant power? Let me go back to the Budapest Memorandum that was signed in 1994. Uh, I was a bit privy to, to, to that work back, you know, in those days. So right, there was right, indeed right. a discussion during the negotiation, what terms should we use? Ukrainian uh, participants insisted on using the word guarantees, while our uh, other counterparts were adamant to, to use assurance. So assurance was a kind of compromise that was implying the 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 the, the shall help when it comes to the point however if you look at the nature of the documents it's a memorandum and binding so legally the mem the those uh, parties the, the, they are not legally bound to say to take action once it's broken i mean it, it's more of a moral and political statement rather than a legally binding document however that does not, uh, let's say, release those parties who signed it from their obligations uh, that, that were undertaken in, in the, the document. So when it comes to the position of the states and, and our Western allies, I think without their help, we would not be able to, 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 to be so successful in the country. In fact, uh, it's been instrumental in terms of, you know, enhancing our defense forces capabilities and uh, providing with the necessary means to defend ourselves. It's so far, it's purely defensive weapons. If you look at what we are receiving from, from the UK, from the US, it's purely defensive weapons. Of course, we would like to have more because we understand that even with those uh, assistance that we get, we are still lacking the power, for instance, when it comes to the Air Force. We would like more to be done. However, uh, their help was instrumental in building up our capabilities. Let me also tell some other aspect of it. I think uh, the resilience and the bravery of Ukrainians was probably one of the factors that this assistance are not just possible, but also evolving in terms of their uh, let's say volume and in, in, in terms of their uh, potential, because uh, I think you were right pointing out there were a lot of expectations that Ukraine will fall like Afghanistan. And when I spoke to our military analysts recently, when I was in Kiev, they said that if Ukrainian armed forces before the invasion were given at least one third of what Afghan national forces had from the US, the situation on the ground would have been entirely different. You know, that would 
completely turn the tables around. And who knows, perhaps it would even deter Russians from attacking Ukraine in the first place. But again, we have to deal with what we have. And so far, let's say the assistance that we are getting is very important. Without it, we would not be able to be so successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that, of course, the anti-tank javelin uh, you know, missiles, I understand the drones were very, very effective uh, on the conventional front. I understand that their, their efforts, I think, to give you some tanks, some Russian or Soviet tanks by Czech Republic. There have been discussions at this. Poland was trying to see if they can share some of the fighter jets. Uh, it, but I also saw recently that the Ukrainian Air Force, or at least the Twitter feed that was claiming to be Ukrainian Air Force, were saying they can even use the F-16 or F-15 fighters if they, they're given a few weeks of training. I mean, I, I mean, this is just, for, for, for some people, this is mind-blowing. I mean, this is like real-time geopolitics and military tactics. And of course, a lot of, I mean, we are at the forefront of perhaps a new kind of warfare and people are trying to understand that. But um, just to end on our, on our interview, because again, I know you're, you're very busy. Now let's go towards the, um, the discussion of the end point here. I mean, Ambassador, in Ukraine, what is your understanding of what is the end goal of, uh, of Kremlin here? I mean, obviously if their end goal was within three days, they're going to take over Kiev and just change the government and put a pro-Russia person. Uh, I understand your former president was kicked out of Ukraine. He was put in neighboring Belarus, probably to put him there back or something. Um, obviously, that plan is out of the window. So what do you think will Russia's next move be? I mean, um, there are fears that what happened in Chechnya, it's a little bit already happening, right? We see in Mariupol, for instance, the the, the, the besieging of the cities, the destruction of the infrastructure there. I mean, and, and this is where we see President Zelensky constantly saying, the only way forward is a peace deal, right? I mean, while resisting, we have to talk about peace, which is quite an interesting thing because you surely have the opposites, right? If you say peace, you don't try to resist much or you, you know, if you're in the resistance mode, you don't want to talk. But here we see President Zelensky showing dynamism and saying, we have to resist so we have a strong negotiating position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Russians. What is your understanding? What is the end game here? And what kind of, I don't want to use the term grand bargain, but workable, whether transitional compromise or more last, long lasting peace deal is really feasible under the current conditions with all the alleg allegations of war crimes, all of the civilian um, casualties, all of this destruction of cities. The Russians have also lost a lot of troops. We're seeing these reports of Russian media personalities call, I mean, asking for blood, essentially. There's also anger in Russia, et cetera. Under these very difficult and very tragic situations, what is the most, I would say, feasible, reasonable peace deal or end game that, that we can look towards? Ukrainians are a very peaceful nation. We never attacked anyone. We never invaded any other independent or sovereign nation. When it comes to defending our own land, of course, we will stand until uh, the last invader will leave Ukraine. So for us, the end game in this uh, war is to protect and to defend our territorial integrity and sovereignty. And that includes generally even the occupied Donbass and Crimea. This is something that we cannot compromise. Mm. Of course, the success on the ground, the resistance of our armed forces and the people makes our negotiation position much stronger. And that's what President Zelensky also pointed out recently. So uh, it is important uh, while negotiating to make sure that you have your priorities right and you have certain uh, room for compromise. However, you also have the red lines that are not uh, even uh, potentially a subject for negotiation. So when it comes to Ukraine, we've been always committed to peace. And in that sense, of course, we are looking forward to achieving a long lasting solution. We are not very much interested in achieving, let's say, a temporary ceasefire because the history of President Putin and his track record, track record shows that for him, ceasefire means just to reload the gun, you know, and to come up stronger against one or the other nation. So in that sense, we, we would like to have something that would provide Ukraine with 100% guarantees, not assurance, and with some practical mechanism how to deploy those guarantees in case Ukraine is threatened again. So uh, 
again, when it comes to, to, to the solution, we, 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 we are committed to peace, but it has to be a one lasting solution based on the, uh, let's say, comprehensive formula that will settle all the things in a very clear and transparent way. When it comes to Russia's end game in this, I understand that the original plan was not just to reincarnate USSR, but also to somehow uh, be in a position to impose their will on the other members of the international community. Uh, why the war in Ukraine is so important for other countries, including the Philippines or some other, let's say, countries that far away for, from, from, the, from the battle itself, because it undermines the whole system of international security. And if we allow the notion of might is right, and this and, and the weaker has to suffer what it what, what it must, you know, then this whole uh, system that we built since the World War II falls into the whole paradigm of peaceful co coexistence put into question. Even uh, the if you look at the President Putin's speech before the invasion, he uh, questions the very right of Ukrainians to exist. You know, he said that Ukraine, were, the creation of Ukraine was a, a result of historical errors and crazy decisions, which is absolutely unacceptable. That's why when you look at the uh, war crimes in Bucha and other places that were liberated from the Russians, we understand this is not the, uh, you know, incidents uh, on the ground. This is the extension of the policy of extermination of Ukrainians as a nation. So if the political leadership does not give us a right to exist from Russia, then what can you talk about the soldiers on the ground? Of course, they get the carte blanche and they, they do all these atrocities on the ground. Uh, after the scenes of Bucha, I can tell you very frankly, as Ukrainian, it would be very hard to talk about peace and to talk about reconciliation because those crimes, those atrocities are absolutely beyond any most cruel, uh, let's say, and unimaginable suffering that were actually imposed on uh, by, by human beings on each other. But President Zelensky has been very committed and he said that even though we may have different emotional uh, attitude toward these events. If you uh, want peace, you have to work for peace. And sometimes it might take, you know, something bigger than just emotion, something bigger than just your personal, uh, you know, feelings. That's why that's what makes a good leader a leader. Thank you very much for that, Ambassador. Just in the closing notes, may I just clarify what are the uh, what are the non-negotiables for for Ukraine? Because we're getting some reports that. Russia is looking at perhaps, again, these are just reports from some of the other allied nations who are in communications with, with Russia are saying that recognition of Crimea as a Russian essentially territory, uh, Donetsk and Donbass, maybe some of these areas, formal autonomy, uh, aside from you not joining NATO. I mean, uh, what are the non-negotiables as far as Ukraine is concerned? Even if some would say there's a risk of even further escalation, let's not forget, I mean, Russia is a nuclear powered nation it has wmds it's a superpower for a reason not only for having a big uh, military so there's there's a fear that this could escalate further unless seriously some of these very difficult issues are discussed at the negotiating table uh, ambassador i know of course everything is still fluid and all but what can you share with us ambassador as far as what we should not expect uh, as far as the uh, ukrainian side is concerned as part of a final negotiated peace deal well, there are two things that are sacred for us, and uh, I mentioned it before, I guess, it's uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Th these are two things that can never be compromised, neither by political leadership nor by the people of Ukraine. We've been fighting for these things for the past eight years, and even though the world was focused on other things, you know, this was the actual warfare for us, and almost on a daily basis we had uh, exchange of fires, some casualties on, on, on our side. So for us, th that fight that's been in place for the past eight years. So we're not going to compromise on our national uh, uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And in fact, when it comes to, to the possible formula, how to accommodate this, given the reality on the ground, let me remind that even before the illegal annexation, Crimea had an autom autonomy, they had their own government, their own parliament. So in that sense, absolutely, uh, there was a formula already embedded in the constitution. When it comes to Donbass, 
uh, anything can be discussed in terms of you know how to empower local governments. However, again, you have to put very strict or very clear logic in that peaceful uh, settlement, security, and then based on the security, you can talk about the elections or whatever. So security comes first. And of course, when it comes to the Russian, let's say, role in all this, uh, we would absolutely demand and insist that Russia would withdraw completely from the territory of Ukraine. That is something also that, that is right. very clear. And, and Ambassador, Russia. you're optimistic that China, which is supposedly a very close friend of Russia, could also be helpful. I know that you have a very good relationship with China too. Uh, and President Xi Jinping had very strong words in terms of the depth of your friendship and cooperation not long ago. Are you, um, I know you have an ambassador in Beijing who should perhaps answer this, but overall in terms of position of Ukrainian government, are you still cautiously optimistic that China could be the middleman here, the ultimate middleman considering that China is perhaps one of the very few countries who has very good relationship with both sides of this conflict? I think uh, China, as the permanent member of the United Nations mm -hmm. Security Council, has a big role to play uh, generally in the world affairs. And of course, when it comes to the war, uh, uh, to the Russian war against Ukraine, because China, I believe they have good relations with both Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but let me tell you this. I got an impression because uh, uh, many years ago I was posted to Beijing as well. So I'm a bit familiar with how to diplomacy and generally political system works there. From my own point of view, when President Putin ordered the Minister of Defense and the Chief of General Staff to put the nuclear weapons on the high alert, uh, the reaction in Beijing seemed to be uh, that uh, even for them, that was something that they will never uh, tolerate, you know, because such moves, they disrupt uh, the international security, they create more chaos. And I think China, as a responsible member of the international community, has been always advocating peaceful development, economic development, and stability. So these are the core values for, for, for and by the way, also non-interference, et cetera, et cetera. So in that sense, I believe China's role can be even more important in the near future. Thank you very much for pointing that out, because I noticed consistently in fairness to China from the Munich Security Conference onwards, they sh said that the territorial integrity of all nations and Ukraine is no exception. That's a term that uh, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi used, actually, should be respected and upheld. And I, and I know that many are criticizing China for economically supporting Russia and all of that, but I think the other side is important and your good relationship with China. So I'm trying to be fair also to our own giant neighbor here. Um, last points, uh, do you have something to say to our audience in the Philippines? I know, um, you know, we are on different sides of the, the planet, but I think Ukraine and Philippines, we share a lot of uh, tragic struggles to be stronger democracies. All of us have been squeezed between major powers and have been trying to navigate our own history, to be captains of our own destiny. So that's why I feel a lot of affinity with Ukraine, even though we may be from completely different continents and parts of the world. There's just something about our tragic history and our heroic struggles for strategic autonomy that I think brings us together. So Ambassador, do you have something to say to our audience, to the Philippine audience? A lot of people who are actually watching and following very carefully what's happening in Ukraine. Today is a special day. Today, uh, 7th of April 2022, is the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Ukraine and the Philippines. So in that sense, it, it, again, it's, it's a special day and my congratulations to all my friends, colleagues and counterparts in the Philippines. From my own personal history, when I first arrived in Manila in 1997, I literally fell in love with these hardworking people, open people, those people who always share the same values with us. So at the human to human level, I believe there are so many connections. When you look at the number of seafarers in the world, Ukrainians and the Filipinos, they are among the most numerous seafarers. And I sense that every time I come to the Philippines, that, that sense of connection, that sense of direction. So I believe even the uh, reaction of the Philippine government on, on, on this war against Ukraine, Philippines openly said that they are ready to receive even the refugees from Ukraine. This is something that we will never forget. We value it very much. And I want to wish all the Filipinas to live in peace, economic development and prosperity. And you can always count on Ukraine as a good friend, not just in terms of official, uh, let's say, uh, communication, but also on, on a human to human level. 
Dia Akio, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, Ukraine Ambassador to the Philippines, Alexander Nechitailo. Thank you very much, sir. And hopefully we can catch up in the near future, hopefully on a more positive note and towards a better direction for your country and for international security. Thank you very much, sir. And maraming salamat sa ating mga kapuso na nakinig sa atin today with this very, very special interview on a very, very serious topic. Maraming salamat. Thank you. Okay, na tayo, Mark? Okay, tayo, Mark. All right. Are we good? Yes, sir. Very good. All right. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I know we went a little bit over time, but you know, I really had to take those out. You know, as you see, I'm very seriously following what's happening, right? Uh, so as, as much as I'm amazed with the depths of your knowledge and it, because very often when you talk to people who are professionally engaged with Ukraine or right. history, etc., etc., they, they don't have so much knowledge and details like Potomkin village and everything. I mean, I don't need to explain these <laughs> things to you. I, yeah, <laughs>